Hey, this episode of the Adventist Millennial Podcast is sponsored by The Haystack. The Haystack is a voice for young adults in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that produces articles, music reviews, videos, and more. What's the and more? Well, you'll have to go to their website to find out. Thehaystack.org. The Haystack. Life. Culture. Theology. Hi. <clears throat> I tried to do a cool voice, but that didn't work out. Um, I hope you all had a good Valentine's Day. Um, here in sunny Southern California, it's not sunny. It's been raining cats and dogs for the past several days. And this morning I went into work and the office was flooded. <laughs> so that was a nice morning bilging water out of the warehouse. Um, but, you know, I like rain. How about you guys? I mean, there's a huge difference between enjoying rain from the comfort and dryness of your own house. <laughs> versus like being in the rain when it's cold and then being wet and miserable but if i'm in the safety and dry uh indoors i like the rain it sounds nice it's soothing you can curl up and read a book you can make some tea i mean who doesn't like that right and especially here in california where we get so little rain when it comes it's, it's kind of nice and it makes the loma linda hills a little bit green for once uh, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> so anyway, today we are going to talk about gaming the system and hashtag justice. Um, and then after that, we are going to talk about love versus isolation, apropos, since yesterday was Valentine's Day, and the Trinity, per your Instagram requests. Thank you for those of you who suggested topics on Instagram. Um, which the Trinity coincidentally ties in with love versus isolation. Okay, why are you just sitting there? Let's go. Now, to start out, Jose, shout out Disruptive Adventism Podcast, um, posted a question on Facebook the other day, and he fra phrased it as whether sensible knavery is evil. Now, <clears throat> this is something that I've thought a lot about <laughs> in my lifetime, and I've had many conversations about it with uh, people, mostly my brother, but I, I've always called it just gaming the system versus... I've never heard it phrased as sensible knavery before, but sure, okay, so either sensible knavery or gaming the system, whatever. Um, so anyway, basically the idea is that if a system is rigged against you, the question is, is it wrong to game that system um, to, I guess, even the playing field a little bit? Basically, like, shaking the arcade machine until quarters come out as a kid. No, I never did that. <laughs> I did that. We did that. Um, but, yeah, that's the basic idea. So, uh, I've never really had a huge problem with this <laughs> in my life. I mean, there's, to a certain extent, there's a certain pride in it, right? If you are clever enough to game the system. Like, for example, one thing that I never felt guilty about but wondered if I should feel guilty about was back when I was in college, um, we had season passes to Universal Studios. And so we... It was before I had finished college, but I wasn't in college at the time. I was just kind of, you know, goofing off. And so we had plenty of free time, and we would go to Universal Studios. I don't know. How often did we go? Once a month or something? We went a whole bunch of times that year. At Universal, if you've never been there, you can get, uh, you can buy a meal bracelet so that for a certain amount of money, I don't know, like 80 bucks or something, um... Was it that expensive? How much was that thing? Anyway, it was more expensive than you would want to pay for a meal. Um, but if you had that bracelet, you could go to any restaurant in the park and get a free meal because you had bought this bracelet. Kind of like an all-you-can-eat thing. So we <laughs> gamed the system by um, just keeping the bracelet. And every time we went back to... Uh, which I don't think you're supposed to do. Every time we went back to Universal Studios, we just, we put it on a little bit loose. We just slid it off. It was one of those, you know, those camp bracelets that you get when you go to summer camp. It's like that unterrible plastic stuff and it like snaps on. So really the only way you're supposed to get it off is to cut it off. But then if you put it on loose enough, you can slide it. Anyway, so that's what we did. Um, 
And we were like, look, it's justified because the food inside the park is so outrageously overpriced that they can't expect anyone to actually pay for it. And then two, um, the bracelet itself was wildly overpriced for the amount of food that you would eat in one day. And then three, they took no precautions to prevent this from happening. Like you would think, you would think the first time we did it, we expected, oh, they would have like a different color for different days or they would have a date stamped on the bracelet (laughs) or whatever. But no, it was just an orange bracelet and we could use it every time we went there. So this was an example of gaming the system that we felt was unjustly overcharging us for food that we didn't even want. (laughs) Actually, just kidding. They had Panda Express in that park, and I always like Panda Express. But the point is, the pizza was gross, though. The point is, they were overcharging for the food, most of which they were just going to throw away anyway at the end of the day if it didn't get eaten or bought. So what's the problem with us gaming the system and reusing our bracelet? Um, and no, I never felt really guilty about that at the time, and then for many, many years, I never did, and, but I did wonder, like, it's kind of the ethics of that question, of whether gaming the system, the idea, the principle of it, is, uh, wrong or bad. But like I said, I don't know, in my mind, there was always a sense of accomplishment, like, if you're clever enough to do it, to find either a loophole, a legitimate loophole, or to rig it back in your own favor, like, more power to you, basically. Uh, Last week, I talked about Elizabeth Holmes, who ran the Theranos scam. Um, After that episode, I was thinking about it. Apparently, now, she's, she hasn't gone to prison, um, I don't know if she will, but supposedly she's like trying to work out her next um her next enterprise and i'm like if she's able to pull that off good for her like go for it if you've taken everyone in that badly like you get points for that don't you i don't know but the real question is are these sorts of things are taking advantage of either a system either a system that puts you at a disadvantage from the outset or taking advantage of someone who is inviting you to take advantage of them and taking no precaution to prevent it. Is this wrong? Now, historically, I've seen the justification in using these tactics as just outsmarting the system and winning because you deserve to win in the game of who can outplay the other can the system outplay you or can you outplay the system um and so in that sense it's like chess which is why it's attractive to me but some people see it as like a robin hood thing like a bleeding heart get the system back for mistreating people like take the coins from king john and give them back to the poor people who he confiscated them from um and it's more more of like a justice thing i i after thinking about it for a while i was like okay is this just the same side of the social justice coin like instead of gaming the system for the chess aspect of it just rejiggering it the way you want it to to rebalance for some kind of injustice that's happened um and when i realized that maybe those two were kind of a little bit similar and probably it's no surprise to anyone listening that i'm not a huge fan of the idea of social justice maybe because i don't really care too much about other people's plights um but when i realized that gaming the system and social justice may actually be two sides of the same coin or even the same side of the same coin i was like oh maybe i have (laughs) maybe i have some personal reflection to do because look jesus didn't do any of those things he didn't go around trying to change the status quo he didn't rejigger the system he didn't even game the system he just played within the system even though the system was unjust even though the system was unfair and this is the concept of the great controversy the whole idea of flipping the tables on a system that's treating you unjustly runs counter to the whole proposition of the great controversy okay guys listen listen this is crazy 
the whole idea of the great controversy is a question of whether God is rigging the system against us and if we need to overthrow that system. That was Satan's accusation. But God's response was never to say, okay, now that you've rigged the system against me by lying, I have to game you. <clears throat> he never said that. He just said, let the injustice be injustice and we'll see which way is a better way. So, so if, if you think of God's law or God's creation as the system, the whole idea of social justice, the whole idea of gaming the system from Satan's perspective is to say, hey, this is not fair. We didn't sign up for um, God's law. We don't really like it. We feel like it's actually constraining. It's actually a little bit oppressive. So therefore, we're not going to submit to it anymore and we are going to turn the tables. That's the concept of the great controversy. And everything that God has done and everything that Jesus has done since then has accepted the fact that you are not going to f eradicate the desire to cause injustice from other people's hearts. You're never going to get rid of evil in the world. You're never going to fix broken systems. You're never going to eradicate all bad systems. So what's the point of trying to do it? It's not an, it's not an admirable thing to do. It's an exercise in futility. And furthermore, it's actually the tactic of Satan to say, I don't like the system, so I'm going to oppose it. God plays within the rules, however unjust the rules are, because the principles, his design for how the world works, the principles on which the reality operates, require everyone to be free. And if everyone is free, that means they're free to create corrupt systems, they're free to oppress, they're free to do all kinds of unmentionable, horrible things to other people. The point was never to stop that from happening. The point was to show why you shouldn't want to do that. Okay, so um, this is a topic that goes much, much deeper than this brief uh, scratching of the surface. I know, <laughs> I know that if you're a person who generally subscribes to social justice as an admirable thing, you're probably recoiling from the comparison... <laughs> to Satan's role in the great controversy. And to add also, this idea has only fully struck me in the course of talking about it right now. So it's something that we'll have to come back to because I think it goes a lot deeper and I think there are a lot more pro profound things to say about it. But at this point, I'm not prepared to say them because I need to think about it a little bit more. But what do you guys think? Is social justice wrong? Is gaming the system wrong? Is it tantamount to Satan's position in the great controversy? Let me know what you think. Email me, message me, send me, leave a poop filled flaming paper bag on my front porch. This is where I don't handhold you guys through the philosophical implications of an idea because it's your job to continue the train of thought as I also independently continue it and we shall reconvene at a future time and compare notes. Okay. Okay. So moving on to the next section about love versus isolation. Um, this is something that I know a lot about. You guys do you know how much of my life has been spent in isolation alone like a lot of my life but the bad part is this is not a complaint it's just a description it it doesn't usually even occur to me how much time i spend alone until like for some reason i'm listening to i'll be gone in the night about the golden state killer and i realize oh I will spend a lot of time alone and I should probably carry mace or an ice pick or something with me. And then I, like, end up reading the Ted Bundy Wikipedia page and freaking myself out. <laughs> but anyway, so much of my life has been spent by myself. Um, I was homeschooled, as you know, but within that, um, when... What was going on? There was a lot of time when I was just at home by myself. I guess my brothers had jobs and my mom had a job, but there was a lot of time that I spent just alone at home. Um, and then in college, of course, I lived off campus, so I didn't associate with other students. I just went to class and I went home. Um, when I was in Ukraine, that was one of the most isolating years of my life. 
one of the hardest years of my life, but it wasn't hard because of the isolation. In fact, that was a little bit of a, a consolation. <laughs> I was consoled by it. Uh, yeah. And so now, now I live alone. I spend most on the weekends. I still find that I don't really particularly want to see any people, <laughs> even though I don't really see any people during the week. I would not be surprised if legitimately more than half my life has been spent alone. So anyway, I, I don't really have a problem with this most of the time. Um, it gives me plenty of time to think. And when I get around other people, <laughs> I just feel irritated most of the time. I'm not sure if I've not just not put enough time into creating those relationships or I'm actually like borderline a sociopath. <laughs> I wondered this legitimately because you know how people say things like, I just feel things really deeply. Uh, yeah, that, that doesn't compute with me. I do not feel things deeply. Um, you know how in movies, there's always like a scene where a psychopath is observing other people and then mimicking their behavior to s come across as normal. <laughs> I feel like that more often than I want to admit. Like, okay, I have this very vivid memory of dropping bombshells here. Um, of Christmas, I don't know, I must have been like 15 or 16. Um, and I had been wanting really badly. This was like in the age of iPods. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't, I was never an Apple person. So I didn't want an, an actual iPod. I wanted a, a Dell, I don't know, what was it called? Like a Dell DJ or something. Anyway, it was basically Dell's version of an iPod. And I just wanted it so bad. And my parents got it for me for Christmas. And I have this very vivid memory of opening it and being like, forcing myself to go through the motions of like acting excited and acting really pleased and feeling that that was unnatural to do even though yes I was very glad and I was very thankful the reason I was doing that was because I wanted my parents to know that I was very glad and very thankful but that was not a natural reaction <laughs> and I remember intentionally putting it on <laughs> for their benefit because I knew that's what you're supposed to do <laughs> how is that bad <laughs> um it's not but it's not that I don't care or that I I mean, I don't know. Do I feel things? I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, it's not that I don't care. It's that a lot of times I literally, it doesn't occur to me to let other people know that I care. Because, you, cause you know, the, uh, the emotion is associated with, in a social situation, an outward demonstration of that emotion that gives cues to other people about how you're feeling, but I don't give a lot of those cues sometimes. Um... Like, for example, I texted my cousin on Valentine's Day. Shout out, if you're listening to this. She's probably not listening. Anyway, I was just asking for a recipe. And then she texted back, like, ha Happy Valentine's Day. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a, a thing that people do. They acknowledge holidays and other people's emotional states and things like that. It's like, this stuff just doesn't even cross my mind. But anyway, my borderline sociopathy is not the point of this. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, so back to the point. You can't love in isolation. So you have to have another person to interact with to because love is an outward is something that's going from you to someone else um and so uh, and so thinking about the trinity this plays into it because we all know if there's one thing christians know or that christians say it's that god is love but what does that mean like let's say before time was established when god was just God, um, living in infinity by himself, can he really be, be love if he's just by himself? Or did he only become love when there were other created beings to love? Well, <clears throat> the Trinity, of course, answers this question. And the first time I heard this explanation was from David Asherick. He did several s sermons about it. Um, and it really clicked for me when when he described it. And I've heard other people describe it since then and I think this is this is a really good point. God is triune. God is three. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because in order to be loved, he must be. Because, because like I said, I have great experience <laughs> in the inability to love in isolation. So I should know if God um, was just by himself, who could he love? How could he be loved? Um, okay. And it had to be three. It couldn't be one or two. It had to be three because in order for there to be complete selfless love, which is what God is, um, you have to constantly defer to the other two. So, so if you just have two people, they can both be so enamored with what they're receiving from the other person that it can still be selfish. Um, so when you have to defer to the third person, that is, that creates the social dynamic to love outwardly and the requirement of selflessness. So it's not selfish love. It's not selfless isolation, (laughs) which I don't know if that's a thing. Um, but it's selfless love because you have at least three entities or three people who are constantly deferring to each other um and this is the model that i talked about in every episode of this podcast in which harmony cannot exist unless everyone is being selfless um i think this is a really amazing and incredible explanation for why god is three persons um And it lends to the idea that Jesus really was showing the example of God's character when he refused to do anything selfishly on earth. And for us to not be able to transfer what he so painstakingly demonstrated on earth to who he was trying to demonstrate on behalf of God, the rest of the Godhead, I think it's I think it's something that's very beautiful that we're horribly blind to most of the time. So so the idea is that there are three people in the Godhead and they all are infinite beings who live outside of time, who have the same power, the same um character. They're not the same person. They're three different people, but they're unified in their mission, their goal, which is to serve selflessly. And they're unified in their love for humanity because they demonstrated amongst themselves. I think it lends credence to the idea that we can trust them to demonstrate it to us. So if God is three and he still continues to want to punish us, that makes him triply tyrannical, right? Okay, so so what about this? And we talked about this a little bit two weeks ago, a week ago. Anyway, we talked about this recently, the idea that Jesus, uh, in Christianity, Jesus is seen as the loving member of the Godhead, and God is seen as the quote-unquote just member of the Godhead. But, But think about it this way. If you had three beings where one was vengeful and the other was meek and mild, how exactly would that work? Um... I mean, I guess you would argue that Jesus doesn't sin, so God doesn't have any reason to want vengeance on him. But isn't vengeful, uh, that that makes them different in character. And it doesn't work. They all have to be equally willing to sacrifice for the others in order to maintain harmony. This was even modeled with Adam and Eve in the garden because you had Adam and Eve and God, and they were all meant to... um, selflessly love each other but obviously eve broke the chain when she selfishly ate the fruit and it's just been devolving ever since and we've been flying out in space not understanding uh the dynamic of the trinity and not understanding what it means to really love selflessly so there you go from my isolated tower of solitary existence i just want to say All you people listening out there, I love you. Have a good weekend.